Hello and welcome to Tank and AFE News. I'm Tom and this is the 14th episode of the Tanks of World War II video series. We have been looking at the different tanks used during World War II in roughly chronological order. And in this episode we'll be looking at one of the most important tanks of the war, the Panzerkampfwagen III, or as we're going to call it, just the Panzer III. With the rise of the National Socialist regime in Germany in 1933, the post-World War I restrictions on German rearmament were cast off, and efforts to introduce new armored vehicles into the German military intensified. As we saw in previous episodes on the Panzers I and II, they started off with the introduction of relatively cheap and easy-to-make light tanks. However, it was realized by the German military that they would need larger tanks, finally deciding on two different models a fast tank with good mobility armed with machine guns and an anti-tank gun, and a somewhat larger tank armed with a howitzer for the support role. Now these two requirements would result in what would later be known as the Panzers III and the Panzer IV. And while the Panzer IV would actually enter service more quickly than the Panzer III, the III was intended to be the primary tank of the Panzer Force, an irony considering that in the Polish campaign of 1939, it was the rarest German tank on the battlefield. As usual for German tank development, several different companies competed for the Panzer III contract, with prototypes produced by Daimler-Benz, Krupp, MAN, and Rheinmetall. Following testing in 1936 and 37, Daimler-Benz was declared the winner, the primary criteria of the prototype being that it was 15 tons in weight and capable of 25 miles per hour. Due to security concerns, the vehicles were misleadingly labeled as Zugführerwagen, or just ZW, which means platoon commander's vehicle. Oddly enough, the ZW designation would persist long after secrecy was no longer required, particularly in industrial circles and documents. Introduction of the Panzer III proceeded slowly, with much of the delay being due to the suspension system. Several different suspensions were tried, being some of the most distinguishing characteristics of the Ausfrongs A, B, C, and D, not until the E do we see the introduction of the six-wheel torsion bar system that would equip all further versions of the vehicle. By the time of the Panzer E, or Panzer III E, we also see the introduction of the 300 horsepower Maybach HL 120TR engine. Now this helped the vehicle maintain the requirement of a top speed of 25 miles per hour, despite the fact that the Panzer III had grown in weight to 20 tons. Now, it should be noted that the Maybach HL120 uh, would also power the Panzer IV tank, making it by far the most produced German tank engine of the war. Over the course of its production run, the Panzer III would be equipped with four different cannons, which might be a record for World War II tanks. I'm not sure. Maybe the Churchill as well. However, the Panzer III generally was somewhat anemic in the firepower category, particularly against the armor on the Soviet T-34 and KV tanks, and against the British Matilda infantry tank, the later Churchill, and of course the U.S. Shermans. Now the Panzer IV, which could be, could be equipped with a high-velocity KWK 47.5 centimeter gun, a gun which would not fit in a Panzer III, replaced the Panzer III as the primary tank for fighting other tanks. Now, following the summer of 1943, the Panzer III was mostly pulled from frontline duty, replaced by the upgun Panzer IVs and the brand new Panzer V Panther. Armor protection increased as well as new variants were introduced. This included spaced armor and also the rather visually distinctive Schutzen plates. However, the Panzer III was never one of the most heavily armored vehicles on the battlefield, with most of these armor upgrades being efforts to catch up with allied armor levels, particularly those on Soviet tanks. As Panzer III production improved, it constituted a larger percentage of the overall Panzer inventory with each campaign, although never reaching the levels needed to fully equip the Panzer divisions. In the 1939 Polish campaign, less than 100 Panzer III tanks were available, out of a total tank strength of almost 2,700. In the French campaign of 1940, the number rose to almost 400 Panzer III tanks, although that's still a fairly small percentage of the overall Panzer force. By the 1941 invasion of the Soviet Union, the Panzer III made up almost a third of the German tank inventory, being the most important uh, variant available. Now, production of the Panzer III would increase year by year, peaking with 2,600 built in 1942. However, by 1943, it was apparent that the days of the Panzer III as an effective gun tank had passed, and production numbers dropped significantly and ended that year. However, production of the Panzer III chassis would continue in large numbers, being used primarily for the famous Stug III uh, Sturmgeschütz assault gun. Now, 
Unlike the light tanks produced by Germany up to that point, the Panzer III was a relatively large vehicle featuring a crew of five men, two in the hull and three in the turret. Like the British, and unlike the French, the German military came to the conclusion in the interwar years that a three-man turret was ideal, letting each crewman focus exclusively on his task, whether that be gunner, loader, or commander. Five-man tank crews would be the norm for most of World War II-era medium tanks, with the noble exception of the Soviet T-34, which didn't get a fifth crew member until the introduction of the T-34-85 variant. Now, the gunner sat to the left of the main gun, while the loader was on the right-hand side. Unlike most tanks of the period, the commander was not located behind the gunner, but rather in the back of the turret, directly in the center. This, of course, put him in line with the breach of the main gun, something most other designs tended to avoid. Each side of the turret had a set of distinctive large hatches providing the main way that the crew entered and exited the vehicle. Now in the hull, the driver sat on the left while the radio operator sat on the right, having an MG-34 machine gun to use in a ball-style mounting. Now it's also worth pointing out that unlike the Panzer IV, the Panzer III did not have top hull hatches for the driver and the radio operator. Despite the fact that from the beginning the Panzer III was equipped with a turret capable of mounting a, a 50mm gun, early versions had a 3.7cm KWK 36L45 gun due to the Army wanting to standardize tank guns with the 37mm anti-tank guns issued to the infantry. However, the Panzerwaffe would get their wish with the F model, which was upgraded with the 5cm KWK 38 length 42 gun. Now, from here on, we'll just refer to that as the short-barreled 50mm. Now, this would be followed by the J and M variants equipped with the more powerful 5cm KWK 39L60 gun, which we'll refer to as the long-barreled 50mm. Oddly enough, Hitler had ordered the adoption of the long 50mm gun early on, an order that was ignored, and production with the short 50mm gun went on in its place. And while he would bring this issue up later when trying to show that he was an expert on technical matters, it's probably a bad sign when the national leader is getting involved with issues as low level as individual tank gun models. Anyhow, all of these guns had fairly weak HE shells when compared to the 75mm or 76mm guns of the mid to late war Allied medium tanks, a disadvantage when attacking soft targets or fortifications. And then finally, the N model, which was the final uh, variant of the Panzer III, would be equipped with a short-barreled 7.5cm KWK 37L24 gun. Now this had originally equipped the early models of Panzer IV, effectively reversing their roles. By this point in the war, though, the Germans had developed a reasonably effective heat round for the 75mm gun, the short-barreled one that is, giving the Panzer III N at least a fighting chance against the medium tanks of the Allies. Of course, the tank also had machine guns, which were intended to be the primary weapon used against enemy infantry and other unarmored targets. Now, the early version of the Panzer III had an MG-34 mounted in a ball mount in the hull, while in the turret, mounted coaxially... Of course, the tank also had machine guns, which were intended to be the primary weapon used against enemy infantry and other unarmored targets. The early versions of the Panzer III had an MG-34 mounted in the hull, of course, and two in the turret mounted coaxially with the main gun. Now, once the 5cm guns were introduced, the number of coax machine guns was reduced to the more standard one, as in with most tanks. Armor protection consisted of flat, surface-hardened armor plate welded together. The early variants used in Poland and France had an armor basis of 30mm. Later versions serving in Eastern Europe and North Africa would see the introduction of increased protection, sometimes by increases in the base armor, sometimes by the addition of extra plate. As was typical of German tanks, the drive sprocket and transmission were in the front of the vehicle while the engine was in the rear, with the drive shaft running through the crew compartment to connect the two. Now, the torsion bar suspension was considered superior in performance to the leaf spring system on the Panzer IV. Of course, later wartime designs would, German designs that is, would stick with the torsion bars as the preferred system, and most other countries adopted torsion bars as well, with the notable exception of the British. Now that said, we would like to point out that the Panzer III was not the first tank with a torsion bar suspension. That honor belongs to the Swedish Landsverk L60. It should also be noted that the Soviet KV heavy tanks were also examples of tanks with torsion bar suspensions in the early war period. 
The Panzer III saw perhaps more upgrades and changes than any other German tank, making its way through the alphabet all the way to Ausfrung N. Now, a video of this nature can't really do justice to every single version and change made to the vehicle, but we will do a quick run-through of each Ausfrung, noting the major changes. Please keep in mind that often older vehicles would be refurbished, leading to vehicles exhibiting a variety of characteristics, making precise identification of individual tanks sometimes a little tricky. Also, production numbers vary a bit from source to source, so take these numbers uh, to be f fairly approximate. Now, the A through D can be grouped together as the development models. There were quite a few different changes made in these, but the main difference was in the suspensions. All of these vehicles were made in very small numbers and featured the 250 horsepower HL208 engine and the 37mm gun, of course. Now, the A had a five road wheel suspension on individual coil springs. The B had an eight road wheel suspension on leaf springs. At first glance, it looks like the Panzer IV suspension, but they are actually quite different. The C was another attempt at the eight road wheel suspension with leaf springs. And finally, the D was yet one more attempt to do the eight road wheels on leaf springs concept. Now, these first four types combined for only 70 vehicles built. Next, we have the actual production versions of the vehicle, starting with the E. This vehicle had 30 millimeter armor all around, other than the rear and this increased weight to 20 tons, and this is where the more powerful HL120 300 horsepower engine and the six road wheel torsion bar suspension comes into play. Now 96 of these were built. The F, now this is a somewhat improved version of the E and the first to be produced in large numbers with 435 made. The short five centimeter gun is introduced later on in the F run. The G is an improved F with the rear armor increased to 30 millimeter. Either 37 or short 50 millimeter guns were used, although mostly the latter. Later in the run, an improved cupola is introduced along with other changes in vision slots and devices, and 600 of these were produced approximately. Next is the H, and this is the first version designed from the start to mount the short five centimeter gun. It also has applique armor plates on the front of the hull, giving it a total of 60 millimeters of thickness. Now the suspension was also altered to accommodate a slightly wider track, and about 286 of this variant was produced. Now the I, now this was a version that never existed other than in erroneous Allied intelligence reports, so you can skip that letter. The J, this is the last major variant. The others that follow are basically modifications of the J. Now the hull armor and the turret mantlet are increased to 50 millimeters without any extra plates of armor as in the earlier versions. So it's all one solid piece, which generally is better than having two pieces welded or, or bolted together. Now these all had the short five centimeter gun, although later on the long five centimeter gun would be introduced leading us to the L. The L is basically just a J, but with a long five centimeter gun and standoff armor of 20 millimeters on the turret front and the hull front. The M is a J with special deep weighting equipment. And then the N is basically a J, but with the short barreled 7.5 centimeter gun passed down for the Panzer IV tanks. Production figures for the J through N are hard to figure out since it was unclear with some of these vehicles, which ones belong to which designation in the records. So for example, tanks that may have been ordered as a J would later get the longer five centimeter gun and be redesignated L, but it's hard to tell that from the, from the production records that are available. However, there were about 4,358 of the J through N tanks made total. Now the N accounted for about 450 of these. The exact breakdown of the rest is hard to say, and after looking through different sources, I'm just going to leave it up to <laughs> all of you out there to do your own research, because I spent about three hours the other night banging my head up against the Panzer tracks, tr Panzer production books, and ugh, trust me, it's not they're not easy numbers to find. Aside from the standard gun tanks, the Panzer III served as the basis for a number of other variants. There were a number of different command vehicles, or Panzer Befelwagen. These were based on several different types of Panzer III tanks, with the early ones usually sporting a fake gun, while some of the later ones had functioning 5cm cannons. 
There was also an artillery observation variant, or Panzer Beobachtungwagen. These were usually built on older Panzer E to H variants. Later in the war, some Panzer III's were converted to recovery vehicles, or Bergpanzers as they were known. About a hundred of the M variant were used as flamethrower tanks, their main gun replaced with a flame projector. Now, some turretless Panzer III's were used as munition carriers. One of the stranger items was the Talk Panzer III, a version that was waterproof and intended to be dropped near the coastline, driving along the seafloor to the beach. Now, these were developed for the cons canceled Operation Sea Lion, or the invasion of England, uh, but later were used in some river crossings to start off Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union. Now, the Panzer III hull was also used as the basis of some self-propelled artillery. Twenty-four of the Storm Infantry Geschutz 33B were built, consisting of a Panzer III hull with a 15cm infantry howitzer mounted in an armored casemate. Of course, the most famous vehicle based on the Panzer III is the Sturm, uh, the Sturm Geschütz III. Uh, this vehicle, though, will get an entire episode on its own, so don't worry, we're not going to really cover it here. Um, and it is arguably as important, or even more important, in the late war period than the Panzer III itself. The organization of German Panzer forces during World War II is complicated. German Panzer divisions throughout the war did not follow a consistent pattern, either in terms of organization or equipment. However, the Panzer III, along with the Panzer IV, were intended to be the backbone of the German Panzer forces. However, due to shortages, early war Panzer divisions and regiments often relied on a variety of light tanks to fill the role that should have been filled by the Panzer III. That said, the Panzer Battalion, or Abteilung, was supposed to have two light companies and a medium company. The light companies would have three platoons of five Panzer III's each and a platoon of Panzer II light tanks. The medium company would have three platoons of Panzer IV and a platoon of Panzer II light tanks. Now also, each company would have a couple command tanks, so in total, 17 Panzer III tanks per light company. However, this model was not always achieved in practice, and in the early campaigns, the light companies were often equipped exclusively with light tanks. As Panzer III production increased, the situation improved, but as the Panzer III started to become obsolete as a gun tank, the basic structure of the Panzer battalions was reorganized again. That said, one of the unique aspects of the German army in World War II was their insistence that tanks be used in Panzer divisions and not issued in independent tank battalions or companies to be uh, attached to other units, as was common practice in other armies. That means if you see a Panzer III, it most likely was part of a Panzer Division or maybe a Panzer Grenadier Division. However, heavy tanks were an exception to this rule and were organized into independent Schwerabteilungs, or heavy battalions. Now, early versions of the heavy tank battalion consisted of a mixed force of Tiger tanks and Panzer III tanks, each platoon consisting of two Tigers and two Panzer III's. Most commonly, the 7.5 cm armed N version was used for this role. Later on, the Panzer III tanks would be dropped from the heavy battalion table of organization to an all, just, all the heavy battalions were just Tiger tanks. The combat history of the Panzer III is pretty much the combat history of the German Panzer divisions, primarily in the period of 1940 through 1943. Now, this vehicle was the primary combat tank of German forces throughout most of the North African campaign, and also in the first two to three years of the war in Eastern Europe. So honestly, it's far more than what can be covered here. That said, the Panzer III served in every theater in which German forces were deployed, with the exception of maybe the 1940 invasion of Norway. The Nazi state produced more Panzer III's, or other armored vehicles based on the Panzer III chassis, than any other AFV during the war. While relatively rare in the first year of the war, the Panzer III would form the backbone of the Panzer divisions in North Africa and Eastern Europe from 41 until 43, when it was superseded by the late model Panzer IV and Panther. The Panzer III based Stug III played an equally important role providing armored firepower for both Panzer and infantry units, and stayed in service till the very end of the war. Certainly, we can consider the Panzer III to be a successful design, although I don't think we can call it a complete success. Designed as a tank gun meant to engage and destroy enemy armored vehicles, it was always a bit deficient in firepower. This is despite the fact that the vehicle was made with four different types of guns, 
Now this deficiency in firepower more than anything else would be the downfall of the Panzer III, leading to its demise as a frontline tank in 43. That said, it had many good qualities, especially when compared to other pre-war designs. It was relatively reliable and had decent mobility. The tracks proved a bit narrow for some of the extreme snow and mud conditions of the Eastern Front, but this was an issue for almost all 1930s designs. The three-man turret gave it a significant advantage uh, over the T-34 with its less efficient two-man turret, an advantage the Panzer III really needed since the T-34 outclassed it in armor and firepower. In the deserts of North Africa, the Panzer III proved more than a match for most of the British tanks, being a more balanced design than the British cruisers or infantry tanks. However, once U.S. M3 and M4 tanks start to arrive in numbers, the Panzer III was at a disadvantage. Compared to some wartime era German vehicles, there are a fair number of Panzer III's in existence. Most notable is the J model at Patriot Park in Russia, the L model at the Bovington Tank Museum in England, and the M model at the Munster Panzer Museum uh, in Munster, Germany, because these are all runners. So there's three original Panzer III's that actually still run. Now, other examples of Panzer III in various conditions can be found in several different European countries, as well as one in Australia, even. Now, in North America, there are several in the U.S. Army's collection, but they are not currently publicly accessible. Most of the Panzer III tanks on public display uh, are J or later models, which makes sense, because those are the ones that were produced in larger numbers. Now, for a full list, we will put a link to the Surviving Panzers website in the video description. There are also uh, some replica Panzer III's out there, including a, a rather nice looking one at the Ontario Regiment uh, RCAC Museum. So if you're in North America, that's probably your only option for seeing something that at least is a very well done replica. The Panzer III has a really long and complicated history, and a video like this can really only scratch the surface. For those wanting to learn more, here are some of the resources out there that are available. For a general overview, the Haynes Panzer III Owner's Workshop Manual is a good place to start. Now, this book was done in conjunction with the Bovington Tank Museum, and it is a fairly recent book, and so therefore still in print. Uh, there's also an Osprey New Vanguard title if you're looking for a fairly quick read on the Panzer III. If you are looking specifically to read about the Panzer III during the 1940 French campaign, we would recommend Osprey Duel... Panzer III vs. Sumwa S-35 by Steve Zaloga. Of course, anything by Zaloga is usually a pretty safe bet that it's going to be a good and well-written book. Also, there is the Osprey Duel M3 Medium Tank vs. Panzer III Kazarin Pass by Gordon L. Rotman. Now, if you really want to spend more money and dive into the Panzer III rabbit hole, uh, then I would recommend... Uh, Walter J. Spielberger's Panzer III and its Variants. Uh, this is a hardcover book, and it's going to run you a bit more money. Uh, and then there's also the five volumes in the Panzer Track series by Tom Yance and Hilary Doyle that cover the Panzer III in great detail. Uh, that's just some of the materials that are out there. There's plenty of other books uh, on the Panzer III that are available, and you can find them uh, just pretty much looking anywhere on the internet. All right, well, that wraps this one up. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe. You can support us on Patreon if you really liked it. Just a dollar a month helps to cover costs and, you know, pay for my time to make these videos, which it's it's really quite a bit of work to do. So uh, this one took a little longer than I had hoped, uh, but hopefully it was worth the wait. Uh, the next video, we will be covering the Panzer IV, and then after that, we're going to dive into some of the early war British tanks. So again, thanks for watching, and we'll catch you on the next one.